Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 600. Yes, woo, 600, we made it. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 2nd, 2020. Different day, new chaos. We will talk about that in a minute. Uh, this is episode 600. You got to watch a couple of videos of people who submitted their uh, We Love Anglican Unscripted and we watch from so-and-so and we are so-and-so. We really appreciate that. I, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Pope Francis did not submit a video. So uh, right here, you, you hurt me, Pope. But next time, when we get to 700, I expect a, a nice video from Pope Francis. Um, George, how's Florida this week? just wonderful yeah. we've started the season where it rains at three o'clock in the afternoon every day yes so it's uh <laughs> summer is here yeah. humidity induced 3 p.m thunderstorms are just the uh the time clock of uh florida for sure uh things are uh doing well in connecticut we don't really have any protest here because we have a large portion of uh, black owned businesses and nobody wants to uh, ruin those. Uh, in Connecticut, we uh, block traffic, which is fine, uh, except nobody's working, so there's no traffic. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, first, we got lots of news out there in Anglican land, and amongst all the chaos COVID, the economy, Trump, uh, race riots in, in America and all that's going on in the world, over in Hong Kong, way across the uh, sea, there, th there's something happened that we also need to talk about. Uh, because in, in the dark of the night, I think China is going to uh, retake, reoccupy, and reclaim Hong Kong in all its glory as their own, George. Well, it's not even in the dark of the night, it's in the open sunlight, Hong mm -hmm. Kong, uh, the Chinese are completing the 1948 revolution. They stopped at the borders of the new territories in Hong Kong. They couldn't make it over the water to Taiwan, the communists. Well, now they've abrogated the treaties they signed with the British uh, when they uh, agreed to the transition of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty. And it's a pretty bad situation that uh, the uh, justice system of China which is no justice system at all it's a yeah. uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, very uh, scary place is now going to be imposed upon Hong Kong citizens and residents uh, so let's say you're uh, so what are we seeing we're seeing Hong Kong newspaper owners Hong Kong dem democracy politicians arrested uh, and charged uh, for sedition and for treason or disappearing. And this is all contrary to the basic laws of Hong Kong. Now, the problem in the Anglican world is that the churches have been sounding off. Uh, Cardinal Zen, who's the former Archbishop, Catholic Archbishop of Hong Kong, has been very vociferous about the Chinese government. This is the Chinese government that on the mainland is destroying churches uh, arresting Christians, putting Muslims in concentration camps is very anti-religious. The Catholic leadership and the Protestant leadership have been quite vocal about this cannot stand. But the Archbishop of Hong Kong, the Anglican Archbishop, has been on the other side. He has supported the Chinese government's takeover of the basic freedoms of Hong Kong. And, and not and, only is Archbishop Kwong the Archbishop of Hong Kong, what else is he kept? He's the head of the ACC, um, a, a, a hot, big leadership role in the Anglican Communion. And let's be clear, Mao communism has no need for Christianity. The only person you're allowed to worship is the head of the state. Um, you can and you can you are forced to be a member of the communist party it's not a uh well you can if you want to be a member uh, you are a member of the communist party and it's hard to see this in this day and age when media allows for transparency when it's when it works well and what when we saw with when, when it works, works well 
we, we saw the Arab Spring. We saw you know lots of things in the last decades where the media working well was able to help reveal and encourage democracy, to, to help and encourage freedom to help and encourage um, smart choices. <laughs> Lots changed in, in the last couple of decades of media, of course. We are to the point now that you're gonna wake up one day and you're gonna see Chinese troops marching through the streets of Hong Kong and you're gonna say, what happened? How did this happen? Well, it, it, it happened because we weren't paying attention. The media wasn't doing their jobs. The government weren't doing their jobs, but George and I are here, and the church wasn't doing its job. Um, George and I are here to help report it. That's uh, something in the dark of night. What it is, I think, extremely distressing <clears throat> is that the uh, Anglican Church of Hong Kong, in in the person of its leader, has decided that the uh, the church must conform itself to the state. Now, there's a history here in Anglicanism in China. K. H. Ting, who was an Anglican bishop who basically signed on with the communists after the revolution and helped start the Chinese three self patriotic movement, which is the state Protestant church, was very big into this, what did they call the Sinization of mm -hmm. Christianity, making Christianity with a Chinese face, which is a very racist, very nationalist, and frankly, it was propounding doctrines that were contrary to the Bible. And these were doctrines that were put forward not by theologians, not by the national evolution of de development, but by the kind of Communist Party in the state. And we now have, uh, in the form of the current Archbishop of Hong Kong, someone who at least appears to be willing to go along to get along. Um, I don't think that he is a, a secret red agent or anything like that, but he has just chosen the path of uh, cooperation with the state sort of turning the uh, Anglican Church into the Chinese version of the Church of England, another branch of the civil service. <sighs> All right, so we're past story one. Now's a great chance to, I, I like that story, click the like button. If you get a chance, you can share this episode, that's awesome. Uh, it's a great chance to go to the comments and uh, a lot of you, uh, at least uh, 18 of you are from China who watch this. You can add your comments if you oh, want. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> that, that, that then they'll be tracked down and blocked. <laughs> I got more from Hong Kong. <sighs> and so uh, if you've not subscribed to the program, please subscribe. And if you don't want to sit and watch us on screen, we have a podcast that's available in the show notes on YouTube. Oh, George. The oh, I've got something that appeared overnight, Kevin, a little yeah. story that's fun nonetheless. Okay, do a fun story quick. Uh, friends, you know how we sort of just love certain people in the church world because they are a constant source of news? Uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was one of them. She couldn't open her mouth without giving us a golden story. Well, another was Kenneth Kieran, the long-term leader of the Anglican Consultative Council, its mm -hmm. general secretary, the paid staffer... Mm -hmm. wonderfully awful fellow in the sense of being a goofball and not he, really doing it he wasn't an evil or a bad person no, he but, and he doesn't like Anglican TV at all no just, he doesn't <laughs> he was the one that uh, Kevin you were going to, to uh, some con uh, orthodox seminary in, sure. uh, yeah, St. Vladimir is in uh, uh, New Jersey over here New York and uh, New York and he put out the call that if I show up Rowan Williams is not going to show up. <laughs> so. Well, Caron became a bishop of Cork in the south. Uh, I'm sorry, of um, well, he's a bishop in the south of Ireland. Yeah. I'll remember which see shortly. Yeah, it's a very tiny, large geographic, small number of people diocese. It's in the, the southeast of Ireland. And so he's been given a lot of committee work to keep himself busy. And so he's head of the Church and Society Commission of the Church of Ireland. And the Church of Ireland uh, puts out, this, this committee puts out documents for the government programs and this and that. So what does the Church of Ireland think? Well, the Church of Ireland's committee has today released a statement saying there are three genders, male, female, and non-binary people. That's and weird. Irish and British law should take into account the fact that there are some people who are either neither male nor female. 
Well, here's the problem. The the Church of England still believes a, he created the male and female, not he created the male, female, and other. He um, not only created the male and female, he documented it. Yeah. <sighs> so that the, 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 it's a small story no, because I don't think any lawmaker pays much attention to what the Church of Ireland says about marriage or anything. But the, the woke quotient of, uh, of Anglicanism is always a source of joy because it's so silly sometimes. Well, you posted a story on Anglican Inc. and um, here, just for some free advertising, it's not even up yet. Oh well. Uh, the The amazing thing is they're not going to open their churches until in Canada. Yeah, you can't until September. In Ontario. The province of Ontario, which is basically Toronto and the surrounding areas of the province of Ontario, their bishops got together a conference call on uh, Monday, yesterday, the first, and they've decided to keep their churches closed through the summer as a sabbatical. That f they are basically s citing the Bible and a period of rest as necessary this summer to make sure the COVID virus is completely gone before they reopen the churches. Now, let's put science to one side because I'm not an epidemiologist, but the misuse of the Bible to justify what they wanted to do anyway is just astounding. It is. Just, it's, it's ironic uh, in so many ways. Now, I have a customer. Uh, one of my bigger customers who has a good relationship with a French manufacturer who provides parts here to this uh, customer in America. And this French customer is shut down for COVID and they're slowly reopening. And my customer's like, yay, finally you're opening. We need to get these parts. Come on over, start shipping them over and stuff like that. We will. However, we need to inform you that holiday is coming up and we're still taking holiday. <laughs> just like, <laughs> oh my lord and so you know it's a strange world uh we live in you know and i, I watch these things with the the church and now we get to talk oh i gotta bring up my show notes sorry people it's another quick piece before we get to riots in america my favorite topic uh people over in england know the story of it's dominic cummings is that his name yeah, I, we. I don't follow it that closely. Uh, he's an advisor uh, in government to the prime minister. He took an unofficial, unapproved uh, trip during the COVID crisis, and the media, being the darlings that they are, pointed it out. And uh, uh, when the media gets involved, and it's not Christian related. The Church of England gets involved, <laughs> and so the bishops have spoken, George. So, what did the bishops say, and, and what did uh, Lord Carey say? Well, a number of bishops decided to become all political and were very harsh, and they went on to Twitter and other social media outlets uh, denouncing uh, Dominic Cummins in, in extraordinarily harsh terms. Uh, Bishop Bain. Uh, went on to say, you know, we cannot trust the government anymore because they think we're mugs. Well, yes, they think you're mugs, but that's not that's <laughs> not new. Uh, the, but in other words, they were very intemperate and impolitic in their attacks, and they were very self-righteous and moralistic. And some commentators said, you know, you've said not a sing, single word about the abortion laws that Parliament is is do, imposing on Northern Ireland. You don't say anything about issues of moral, uh, where the church does have a legitimate voice to speak out, yet here you're getting involved in the foibles of party politics and virtue signaling. Well, Lord Carey on June 1st had a an article in the Daily Telegraph, which unfortunately is behind a paywall. You'll either have to pay the Telegraph to read it or some rogue websites have copied it without legal permission. Um, not us. Not us. We can't do that. Uh, we don't want to get sued. But Carrie has said, look, it, this was a terrible mistake that uh, 
involving the church in uh, partisan politics and virtue signaling, and it does nothing for the country, does nothing for the church, does nothing for people. George Carey was the voice of reason and the voice of, he was the adult in the room in this uh, discussion within the Church of England about uh, the uh, COVID uh, moral moralizing. Yeah, it's, so it's, Kudos it's... to George Carey. Well done, Lord Carey. All right, on to riots in America. Um, this may be coming as a surprise to you, but George and I are white, and if you don't want to hear two 50-year-old uh, white men talk about race in America, I understand. I get it. Um, are we the best people to talk about race in America? No, we're going to give you um, the clean Ronald Reagan version of it, uh, so to speak, because that's how we... That's our understanding of how we're brought up with it. Uh, truth, being uh, born black in America is a different journey, journey for the most part than being born white. Um, it's a, a scar America has uh, taken over from its years of slavery. Um, it is a scar on our country and it is something that we can use for good. Um, we can uh, use it to glorify God by trying to heal the, the pain, but you'll never remove the scar. The scar is there to remind you never to look back. We don't want to repeat that history. Um, we've also learned you can't end racism through legislation and through laws. It has to be conducted person to person, heart to heart, uh, and you can't just force uh, a solution to racism legally upon people. It, we found here in America that doesn't work. Around the world, or I should say around America, there's also different experiences in being black. Here in Connecticut, the diff growing up black is different than growing up black in uh, Texas or growing up black in California or growing up black in Minnesota. Uh, it, it's different <clears throat> around the country is, as it is with growing up white. Um, it, there's just different things, different polities involved. Here in Connecticut, we have a large black business ownership. You're going to wonder when you turn on the news, well, why isn't Connecticut burning down? Well, there's a lot of black men who don't want these riots here in, um, in Connecticut because they've been building businesses for 50 years. They've been doing what they were told makes successful Americans. And uh, if you want to go protest, go block traffic, that's fine. But please don't burn down our black businesses. You know, and I have many friends as a businessman here in Connecticut who are black. And one of the things that disheartens me is sometimes they say, you know, I. When I'm interviewing a black person who's coming from the inner city, I don't immediately reach out and want to hire this person because they have been uh, brought up to understand business differently. They have been brought up into the system, the systematic racism. Uh, and we teach them that being black is not good, that being black is uh, something not to be proud of. We teach them that uh, the world hates them because of the color. And I, as a, you know, when I speak to my, my black business friends, I, I can't always take that type of person and, and transform them. Now, I have Nigerian friends who come here to America and they don't notice the racism at all. They set up businesses, they're successful. They, uh, they have this frontier men mentality because when they were early in their education, they were not told it's horrible to be black. They were told we are frontier men, black people, and we will conquer the world. And they do. They're great businessmen. And so you can't just say being black in America is horrible. I think being brought up in the public education system as a black person is horrible. It's, it's, it, it is a systematic racism. Uh, and when I talk to my black friends, business friends, church friends who are successful, many of them avoided that or were over, able to overcome uh, the systemic racism. Uh, 
it, it's hard to watch. It's hard to understand how 50 years after Martin Luther King, we're still dealing with this. And it's sad because it's self-perpetuating and it's history repeating itself. And once again, here's two white guys trying to talk about racism. Thankfully, uh, well, Kevin, I, yeah. I think you might be your. I think you're beating yourself unnecessarily on the line of two white guys talking about racism. If uh, there is going to be improvement in society, there needs to be a conversation. Oh, sure. And that in dog involves dialogue of all parties. Just to see, in other words, one of the problems we've seen this past week is the failure of black leadership to uh, to rise to the situation. Now they've lost control. Uh, to of the streets to the Antifa movement, so any you know when we had the uh, death of George Floyd uh, under in police custody, but what we do know is that at that moment the entire United States was of one mind. Well, we need to do something about police brutality, and if there's a racist angle, we're willing to talk about it. So you had everyone from Franklin Graham on the right all the way across the spectrum to the left saying we, I, we identify the problem. Then, and we support the protests. Now the point of protests is to get other people to change their mind. And now, where the protests have gone now is not to change people's mind, but to basically close minds and hearts. Because if all you do is say we need if you're trying to talk to the white majority and say we need to have these changes and then you have four or five nights of television showing young black men and women looting black owned stores in the inner city and beating up old shopkeepers with uh, two by fours uh you've lost the moment you've not, the leadership has not spoken out to distance itself from the anarchists and the antifa people and I think it's important to take a, 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 a 30,000 foot view. Our trajectory as a nation was good. If you wanted to participate in politics, in business, in religion, in any part, your color didn't matter. You could succeed. Yes, you had a different journey. Kevin's journey was easier than my fellow black businessmen, but you could achieve it. You could, if you wanted to, become president. We've had a black president. So if you look into the 30,000 foot view, the trajectory that America was on was, was good. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't fast enough for many people, but we were slowly understanding and working out that scar that we will always carry with us. Well, you know? let me just, I'll give you some specifics. Uh, well, the uh, Rush Limbaugh, who is a very, you know, famous uh, political commentator on the conservative hot side, had a black podcaster, Charlemagne the God, I think, on, and to and Rush Limbaugh wanted to initiate a dialogue. How can we go forward? What do we do? He was not looking to beat up or trap. This was a golden moment of somebody, Rush Limbaugh, who basically has the heart of conservative America beating within him and who people will listen to the majority without much uh, uh, to listen to. And the guy comes back, and Charlemagne the God comes back, well, we need to undo systemic white racism. And the point is, that's no answer because tell me which button you push or which lever you pull to end systemic white racism. In other words, the moment is, okay, we had an example of this in prison reform. Uh, Kanye West went to President uh, Donald Trump with some concrete proposals about how to reform the justice and the prison system. And it was done. And it's in the process of being done. Now we have leaders who, if you want to respond to uh, the police police brutality and economic inequality, instead of putting out concrete proposals of, of trying to expand the pie to try to create all people in, what you have are people like who are more interested, the black leadership that I've seen on television, for instance, on the cable news networks, are more interested in perpetuating the crisis to keep themselves 
in the eye than in solving the crisis. We see this in the church world. We have people appearing on the, the internet with uh, this self-righteous moralizing, you can't know the black experience because you're not black. Fine, that's a truism. Yeah. You can't not you cannot know anybody else's experience. You can't know the white experience if you're you not can't white. Know the white experience. <laughs> no. You can't you can't know my experience. You didn't go to Yale. You didn't go to a boarding school. You didn't grow up in Palm Beach, Florida. How can mm. you speak to me? Yeah. You know, I can I can be just as uh, priggish as that. But the the point the point is that doesn't do anything. And what we've seen right now is a ma see the difference with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King reached out and worked with the majority. And he was, he was able to reach and offer concrete proposals, and he was also about to speak about the future. I have a dream speech. He talking about the future, and he's talking about what everybody wants, and then he's offering ways to get there. What we have now are we have the people who hold that position of Martin Luther King who are saying, I want to continue pounding on people because I have I'm unhappy with you and and guess what nothing is going to arise from that people will go back into their shell life will go on and all the gains of 400 percent growth in black small businesses and the lowest rates of black unemployment ever recorded is that yeah. going to continue no, with I, the current uh, with the current polarized environment of uh, these terrible terrible leaders so now also leaderless in all of this is the church the church doesn't have a voice <laughs> has lost its voice in uh in in race speak in race negotiations and in, in understanding any of this well what's uh, the i kevin i'm going to be mean i'm going to say the problem is that the weakest link in the church is driving his voice I Episcopal, could agree with you, yes. <laughs> in the Episcopal Church, you've got the Bishop of Washington, Marion Buddy, who is real. I'm sure she's a sweet, nice person, but we're yeah, talking about being promoted way over your competency level. This is yeah. the Sarah Mullally of the Church of England. And so St. John's Lafayette Square has an arson attack from Antifa and anarchists, and Donald Trump does a photo op. And all she does afterwards, the Washington Post is filled with her righteous indignation that Donald Trump would use the Church of the Presidents as a photo op. That's her church. She well, comes across as so petty and useless. She does. I would. I personally was surprised that she recognized that he was holding a Bible. So I'm just going. I'm going to say, uh, Bishop Buddy. I'm glad you recognize that. You know, the there's so much irony in watching the Episcopal Church react to this. Uh, Donald Trump walked across the street and he used a Bible as a prop. And the church who's used the Bible as a prop for 60 years gets all offended. How dare you use the Bible as a prop for your ideas? Oh my gosh. Well, the ACNA isn't really doing that much better of a job. Now, of course, it's not, you can always, you can't top the Episcopal Church for being crass, but uh, the ACNA it's not covering itself with glory right now either well I mean they are to the point they're willing to listen you know but uh, some of the people they're listening to uh, are proponents of you know critical race theory and other woke theologies and I want to go back to the 30,000 foot level here and I say this in all humility and uh, this is Kevin speaking. White shaming is racism. I, I hate to say it, but it, it's another form of racism. You don't understand because you're white is like saying you don't understand because you're black. And that is racism. Sorry. It's hard to say it. I, I, and I don't want to say it. But if we have to have honest conversations, we have to acknowledge that we're on different journeys because of our skin. But we have to understand that out there are people who are successful with that skin color in the same journey. You know, here, here's a perfect example. Two white guys on a different journey. George has schooling in his, his pedigree. You went to, uh, let, let's name them, Duke. You went to Oxford. You went to Yale. Went to Wharton. Wharton. Kevin dropped out of college, 
his sophomore year. Kevin doesn't regret it, but my journey has been a little harder because I don't have that little piece of paper that says I earned a degree from college. And you don't have the student loans. <laughs> I don't have the student loans. That's true. I have no student loans. However, my economic success, my uh, uh, spiritual uh, journey, uh, my family journey, everything uh, that I could be, it's been a harder walk. It's been a harder journey. I've had to fight and I've had to argue with people who say, well, you didn't get a phone in your school. You're no good. I, you know, it's just like, it, it's a harder fight but I'm so much better for fighting it. I'm a better person for having to fight this fight. And uh, you know, here I am, uh, I'm on the cusp of retiring in my mid fifties uh, because I was willing to fight despite what people thought of me. So it, it, it is what it is. I think George and Kevin <laughs> have covered racism and riots in America. What can you do? Oh. Is that your phone? I hear a phone beeping out, buzzing away. Can you take it off the, the, the table where the microphone is? There, just lift it out there. Yeah, cool. Right there. Okay, what can you? Well, what? pray. Yeah, pray? Yeah, my Actually, gosh. open the Bible. Oh, right. Open the Bible. And <laughs> see, here's the thing. There is nothing new under the sun as far as sin goes. Uh -huh. We've been here. We've done that. And the way forward is very, very clear. It's yeah. turn your life, your heart, your soul over to Jesus Christ. Love your neighbor. Uh, it's just so useless, the chatter and noise, when we have the answer to all these problems right in front of us. Through human history, we know that riots seldom work they, in the long term. Uh, they are... It the, for short-term insurrections here or there, wonderful. Is this the Boston Tea Party? Not in the slightest. You know, we're what? not fighting a minarchy here. We have a nation where you can rise up to the top regardless of your color. I can prove it. His name is Barack. One, well, one thing I, I want to caution our viewers. Um one of the modern things that many of us who have traditional backgrounds and educations aren't aware of is that wor words change meaning so that you can read these manifestos and you can read these declarations and you can say we're against racism we're against this and that but the people offering these declarations have different meanings of the word racism and equality and justice than you may think that you have and so we've reached a point where you need to read carefully where things come from before you jump on their bandwagon. And so we have people, I think, who may be unaware, signing on to statements and documents, conclusions that do not mean what they think they mean. So just be thoughtful, be careful, and don't See, this is the one of the problems with the Episcopal Church. We went down this road of what does love mean for the past 60 years, you know, Jesus is love. So now we're in a point where we can have bishops with a straight face like Mary and Buddy saying, well, Jesus is love, therefore homosexual marriage is of God. You know, they've changed the words of love, what love means. This is what we're seeing when you have introductions of neo-Marxist ideology of critical race theory and things of that nature. Stay away, folks. It's oh, a poisonous well. It is. And you'll get nothing good from this. Just fight for the right, fight for truth, do the right thing, praise God in all things, but keep clear of the nut jobs. <laughs> nut jobs. Oh, and, and that's the good thing about media in 2020. They promote the nut jobs. <sighs> George. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 600 of Anglican Unscripted.